I just was like dumbfounded when you approached me and said, do you want to just go on a trip like by yourself? Yes, all the time. So I chose to go to Costa Rica for a week. I got an Airbnb upstate, decided to go to Hawaii. Yeah, it was a lovely and exotic New York City. I usually, whenever I'm creating a new work, it's like I like to have something that's very visual. Um, and so like, I was like, I need to experience all the things I can experience. It was sort of the first time that I had any time alone. It was the most peaceful, warm, wonderful place. There were monkeys in the trees that made noise at all times. And it took me a couple of days to even realize that that's what that noise was. You hear the jazz music in your hotel room and it became like my soundtrack for, for the retreat. For a second year in a row, we couldn't gather a company of four playwrights along with actors and directors up in New Haven for our typical summer residency. And as we know, the last year plus, thanks to COVID, has made the daily life obligations and complications more intense than ever. And so when we were thinking about how to adapt the summer residency in 2021, we came up with the idea of allowing playwrights to design their own writing retreat, and they could get time and space in a location of their choice to really dive in on a new draft. So with generous support from the Howard Gilman Foundation, we were able to give each playwright a budget for travel, for housing, for food, and also a professional stipend for the week of work and then asked them to design a retreat that would be at least seven days. Our playwrights more than rose to the opportunity and came up with some spectacular and productive and as you'll see, sometimes jealousy inducing writing retreats. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to hear more about all of them. The four playwrights that we um, selected for this opportunity were Blue Beckford Burrell, Amina Henry, John J. Caswell Jr. and Jessica Huang. All right. So, Jessica, I'm going to start with you because you went first out of everyone back in the spring. So I would love for you to tell us where you chose to take your individual writing retreat, what you worked on while you were there, and how your chosen location ended up impacting what you were writing. Yeah. Um, I So I went just upstate. I wanted to maximize the amount of time that I could have. So um, I got an Airbnb upstate and went in March, I think it was, and um, worked on a play that I had a deadline for. It was a, um, an audible play. It's called Song of the North Woods. And it's about um, it's a, an eco noir that takes place in the North Woods of Minnesota. So it felt really good to be in sort of a wooded, uh, sort of isolated setting um, because that's where the story took place and it was really it was just really um, inspiring. Did I hit it all? No, what are the other questions? What, what kind <laughs> of what kind of Airbnb location was it? Um, it was a beautiful cabin and um, and it was what was it? It was really sunny and it was huge. And um, I've been, I mean, obviously I had been really cooped up in my little apartment here with my dog and with my husband. And it was my, it was sort of the first time that I had any time alone for over a year. And, um, and I, I love the people I've been cooped up, people and <laughs> creatures I've been cooped up with. Um, uh, very, it's been a very, I don't know, we've really bonded over the past year, but I also am an introvert and really, really value alone time. And so um, those, I think it was 12 days were incredible. <laughs> it's just really nice to reconnect with myself and um, read. I, I will confess that the first day that I got there, I just stayed in bed the whole day and read, just read a novel. The entire day it was it felt so luxurious and so incredible um yeah and then I wrote I wrote a second draft from beginning to end I just pounded it out and it was really really productive that's amazing and you you uh you described the 
audible play as an eco noir and I think I've read a few pages of it so I have to ask was it totally spooky to be <laughs> by yourself in a cabin in the woods writing a story that took place in a sim similar setting where scary things do kind of happen yeah it was totally spooky it was it was it was, it was, it was so sunny the, the cabin was so beautifully like positioned that by day it was just like the most beautiful light filtered through the tree it was gorgeous and it was the most peaceful warm wonderful place and then when it got dark the the cabin also there was only one fatal flaw of the place and it just didn't have any like lamps so I either had to turn on all the lights where I felt like very exposed because they're this big, huge picture windows. So I felt very exposed if I turned on all the lights or be completely in the dark. And so, yeah, it was, so by the time it got to be night, it was super spooky. <laughs> and there was motion lights on the front. So then if, you know, if like a deer walked by, the all the lights outside would turn on. And so, yeah, it, <laughs> there were a couple times. How do you know it was a deer? I just told myself that. <laughs> <laughs> you just described at least half of a scene of John's play Man Cave, by the way, which that's fun. <laughs> you did. It just adds to the spookiness, and I'm totally projecting. Um, could you just tell us what an eco noir is yeah, for I, you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't. I'm sure that that's a thing. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's ever been defined for me, but, um, but essentially it is, a, it's a noir style story that um, is really connected to resources and to the, the changing environment due to climate change. So, um, so there's, you know, the, the very human uh, mystery story at the core of it, but it's really impacted by the way the environment is changing due to humans interacting with it. Thank you so much, Jessica. Amina, over to you, same question. Please tell us where you chose to take your individual writing retreat, what you worked on while you were there, and how your chosen location impacted your writing. So I chose to go to Costa Rica for a week. Um, I was in, like, laughing at me, John. Um, Which is amazing. I, um, I uh, was there, yeah, so I was there for seven days. I was in a very small little town called Santa Teresa um, at a surf yoga lodge. Um, and <laughs> part of the reason why I chose that is because I, I need activities uh, on a retreat in order to feel like I'm just not the kind of writer who does very well when I have just oodles of free time in a strange way. I need a kind of structure. So um, because that there were surf lessons included, I, I would do that in the morning. I would write in the in the um, from like 12 to five or, or five, six. And then I would take a yoga class in the evening. And that felt like that worked for me um, to kind of have these activities to kind of bookend my my writing day. So now are you an avid surfer? <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> Um, I had never surfed before, so that was the other thing. Um, it was kind of a bucket list thing, and um, I was very excited to try. And um, yes, I, I would love to surf for the rest of my life now. But, you know, in New York, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I will definitely surf again for sure. And you what was go to Blue's old stomping grounds of Far Rockaway and get on the board. Yes, I could. Do, it's just, it's cold. Costa Rican water is warm, guys. <laughs> so warm. It's like taking a bath. But anyway. And what was the project you worked on while you were there? Um, so I was working on two projects while I was there. Uh, one was an adaptation, a, adaptation of Much Ado About Nothing um, that, I'm, that I have a commission for. And the other one is a play that I'm writing just because it's not a commission. And it's a play about... Um, cults kind of, but it's really, a, it's, it's a play about a, a band, um, a musical band, um, but it's also a play about cults. So I worked on those. I did not finish either of them, but I made significant progress in both of them um, while I was there.
What was the food like? Question. So good. It was just uh, very fresh. Uh, Santa Teresa, it was a lot of um, people walking around in bathing suits and drinking smoothies and <laughs> whatnot. So, so very healthy, uh, very tropical. Um, I loved it. I love fish and they had like great fish options. So it was great. Um, and I'd never been to Costa Rica before. Um, but it kind of reminded me a little bit of Jamaica, which is where my family is from, which felt really nice. Mm -hmm. and what was the um, other? Yeah, and was the I other. know to ask this because we talked about it, but can you talk about the wildlife? The monkeys, yes. So I do, so they're just everywhere. There's like dogs everywhere, um, just on the street. Uh, in restaurants, which were mostly open air, which was also great. It was a very outdoor culture. So nobody was really in masks at the time because I went in May. Um, mm -hmm. And there was sort of, because mostly it wasn't indoors, you could kind of get away with not wearing a mask. Um, and then there were monkeys in the trees that made noise at all times. And it took me a couple of days to even realize that that's what that noise was. Um, and I, after, I do remember after a couple of days, being at the lodge and asking someone like, what is that? Like, does anyone else hear this like groaning thing? Like, what is that? And so finally someone was said, they're monkeys. I mean, you haven't seen them. And she was just like, look. And I looked up and there were just all these monkeys in the trees that I hadn't actually seen until, cause I hadn't looked up, which, which made me feel like I needed to think about my life a little bit that I hadn't actually looked up um, at the trees to see all of the monkeys. But to be fair, though, the trees are really, really tall. So I hadn't looked up high enough, I should say. It's the old saying, you can't see the monkeys for the trees. Yeah. I think that's it. <laughs> They're actually quite soothing, that noise. And now I listen to a Costa Rican rainfall white noise when I'm writing often because of, because of going there. Thank you, Amina. Thank you so much. OK, Blue you're up to tell us about where you took your retreat, what you worked on and how it impacted your project. Oh, cool, cool. I knew I was next. <laughs> um, so I decided to go to Hawaii, um, uh, which was a tough decision between the Big Island and uh, Oahu, <laughs> but I ultimately went with Oahu. Um, and uh, I guess, what I guess during the time I was just like what where is a place that I can go during this time that's COVID that doesn't feel like very similar to where I am that's also probably going to be warm and feel like really nice and also not feel exactly stressed out about uh the, like the precautions because Hawaii was really really tough <laughs> to get into so I didn't feel like stressed out being outside or like around people knowing that they had really, really strict um, guidelines. Uh, and so I ended up there and I spent uh, like half of the trip in Honolulu and then the other half like in um, like a main, the center of the, the island. Um, and it was for, I like to say it was seven full days but it was like nine days and like not counting the travel. I don't like to count the travel days because <laughs> that was a very, very, very long trip. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think I too, like Amina, like I needed to have a lot of things, activities to do because um, my aim was to get as much information about Hawaii um, as like an outsider because I wanted to write a new play a new comedy that's set in Hawaii. And so like, I usually, whenever I'm creating a new work is like, I like to have something that's very visual. Um, and so like, I was like, I need to experience all the things I can experience so that I actually have like a very concrete, like factual based <laughs> foundation to like start the play. Um, and so it it was really great. I think the, the first day, like it started out with the hardest thing we could possibly do which was hike coco crater <laughs> and as i'm saying it like every time i like say it out loud i'm like i can't believe that happened because it was truly the most terrifying thing <laughs> i have ever done in my life it's like 
the, there's like no slope. It, at some point there's like, you're just like bare mountain climbing up this old like railroad like track that they used during the war. And like, there's just like a part that's just, just a bridge and you can like see down and it's, it's, it's terrifying. But people like the native, like people who are Hawaiian, like we met a couple people going up and they're like, yeah, we do this every day, you know, it's fine. And I'm like, what? They're like babies, children crying on the trail. It was very intense. <laughs> um, but when we made it to the top, it was like the most uh, beautiful, majestic thing ever. And so like, I have that in my head, but I also am like, this is great material <laughs> um, for comedy and like all the shenanigans that can happen on a hike that you are not prepared to go on. Um, so uh, I'm like, did I answer the question? So yeah, I went to, to, to kind of like, you know, recon work um, and just kind of just have some space and time away from where I was for like months and months and months. And I also really needed some time to actually just retreat and not do and not think as much because I had just finished writing a new play and I kind of needed a break. <laughs> um, and so like, that was, that was great too. Um, uh, did I answer all the questions? You did, yes. Great. And yeah, it's so interesting because you actually went to your location of choice with the intention of gathering mater material to write a play set there. So it was, so it was deliberate in that sense. So I'm curious if so you went in with an idea of what you wanted to write in the setting, did anything surprise you as you were gathering material for it? Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. I think, I think, I don't know if this is surprising, but just like, there was this garden we went to, this is a botanical garden, this is a lot of botanical gardens, but this one in particular, like you can't, you can drive through it, you can't, record you're not supposed to like record you can't stop to record and I was like what why and then I'm like oh we like drive through I'm like okay I can see why you can't because literally it felt like I would like you you drove you drove in and it's like the garden of like Eden opened up before you and then it was just like of course I'd want to get out of my car and like capture it and like there was like a, a little visitor center and we're like trying to take pictures and like none of the pictures are doing justice to like what we're all witnessing. And we're just like, this is just so beautiful. And like, there's this thing that explains like all this land is formed by like the inside of a volcano that has like been like washed away slowly. And so it's just, it's just so beautiful. And I think that was like the most surprising because I couldn't there was no way for me to imagine this in my head, even though I'm like, yeah, I'm going to Hawaii. I heard like how stunning it is. And like, we've all seen like Lost and all the movies shot there, but like, it's like, they're not editing. <laughs> like it really, it really looks like that. Um, I think the other surprising thing is like Amina had mentioned like going there to Costa Rica and, and feeling like some similarities between um, like my uh, family, Jamaica and, and Hawaii and like the food and like what they eat. And it's like so very, very similar with like what they do with the food and like how it's made and what they eat. So that was also kind of surprising. But then I was like, I guess if you're like on like an island that's Caribbean, there's very few things you're gonna have to like eat and you just become really creative with it. So you went to gather material and you were the one gathering the material, does this mean that you're ending up in your Hawaii comedy? Yes, I guess so. I am definitely, uh, no, I mean, I'm I'm using myself, but I can't say that it's myself. I'm very, I, I guess, exaggerating flaws to create, uh, to poke fun at. So yeah, sure, like, I, yes. I'm gonna say the answer is yes, <laughs> but also, the character is, I don't think is really me. <laughs> At least I hope people don't experience me that way. <laughs> You're just getting that on the record for yes. when people read the first draft, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be reading it when you eventually hopefully share it with us and be like, okay, which one is, how is this blue? Looking for traces of blue. It's going to be very exciting. No pressure. 
And all right, John, let's hop over to you and your your retreat, which was a little different. We jokingly called it an anti-retreat when you first uh, brought us your idea for what you wanted to do. So tell us about where you went and what you worked on. Yeah, um, jealous inducing is definitely the word for this call. That's why, I mean, when you met, said you went to Costa Rica, I was just like blown away because that's not what I did. I went to, um, you know, the lovely and exotic New York City. I love um, that though. Yeah. I love that you did that. <laughs> like... I, I moved um, upstate to Hudson, New York about four months ago, um, which is beautiful and um, scenic and, you know, it's pastoral and just great. Um, but I started getting used to it. I started getting used to writing in this kind of setting. And I decided that I needed to go back to where I first started the play, which was New York City. Um, so I stayed at the Roxy Hotel. I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Roxy, um, but it's in Tribeca. And I've always wanted to stay there because of the jazz music in the lobby, which happens every single night. And if you're ever thinking about taking doing a writing retreat at the Roxy Hotel, just know that all the hotel rooms are on the lobby. So you hear the jazz music in your hotel room until 11 o'clock at night, sometimes midnight on the weekends. Um, so there is no escaping it. And it became like my soundtrack for, for the retreat. And I started to love it. I started, and I've been listening to jazz ever since I got back, like nonstop, because it just infiltrated like my brain. Um, so it was, it was an experience and it was a much more frightening experience than I anticipated. Frightening in the sense that um, it was completely isolating, even though you're in a hotel with, you know, hundreds of other guests. Um, being in a hotel feels very anonymous and feels very, um, I don't know, just after a while, it starts messing with, at least for me, it started messing with my head and started making me feel um, a little paranoid, um, which was actually really ended up being really helpful because the play that I'm writing, Man Cave, um, that I was working on while I was there is sat in a very confined, claustrophobic, um, sort of insanity inducing space. And so it started to it started to feel like that as I was writing it. So I felt like, like one of the characters in my own play. I was constantly walking around the hotel and, you know, there were service workers everywhere that started to remind me of my play too, because the main characters were trying to subvert um, this idea of, of service workers and what they experience and how they live their lives. So I was just surrounded by all of these elements that I hadn't even like predicted or thought, you know, would be there or would have an impact on me. Um, so it was great. It was really uh, spooky at times, relaxing at times, maddening. Um, and I, I had a great time overall. Um, I got really into watching the Olympics. Um, that was like the thing that I did when I took breaks is I just got into my bed and like, I got really into women's beach volleyball. And I was like following the entire tournament and like tracking everything, which is strange for me because I typically don't get into sports, but I was like gung ho about the women's American uh, volleyball team. Um, yeah, what did I cover everything? I don't know if I did. Well, I'm so curious with the instinct to come back to New York. What did you take in about New York? And what did you sort of keep out about New York on your visit? Um, well, I was reminded about all the reasons why I wanted to leave New York. And they came roaring back. Um, I thought maybe after four months gone, I would have like developed some kind of, I don't know, tolerance for it, or maybe, maybe like I would have uh, felt more like a tourist and had more fun than I did. But but no, everything was like ten times worse than I than I remember it being, um, which means my tolerance for New York City has definitely gone down since I since I left. I'm gonna say, John, the tolerance will never go back up again. <laughs> it, like every time you go back in, you're gonna be like, this is why I had to leave. <laughs> No, you guys, I'm going to stick up for her. She is amazing. New York is amazing. Yeah. She doesn't care about us, but it's a cold yeah. love. But this is actually how Amina got staffed on the new Sex in the City reboot. <laughs> Lines like that. No I, no, I love New York. I mean, 
Yeah. Well, let me take that back. I love Brooklyn, so which is actually different. So it is different. Yeah. yeah. Was there any sort of practice that you intentionally took up while on retreat or found yourself doing without intending it that became part of your process? It's really funny the things that we we pick up when we're gone that we bring home with us. I don't know. I, I was thinking about that as we all were talking. And um, I don't know if that feeling of being alone and like what, what we can teach ourselves while we're alone about what we need as writers is something that I've been thinking a lot about. And, um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything in particular ex aside from just even that. There, the, um, I, I can be a people pleaser sometimes and it can be really hard to get work done when it feels like I, when people need me all the time or, and not just the people I live with, but my, you know, my family on the phone or whatever it is. And, um, and I sort of took up, uh, when I came back, I took up this sort of mantra, like, what would I do if I was alone is a thing that I ask myself a lot now. Um, uh, and I, when I think about it, I think about going to that place. What, you know, what did I do when I was alone? How did I care for myself when I was alone? What would I do right now if no one was here, no one needed me, no one was watching me? Um, so it's kind of in a way like the inverse of what you're asking. <laughs> um, uh, because what I did there is just, I just was by myself and I just was, like I just ate when I was hungry and I um, gave myself the care that I needed and I didn't need to take care of anyone else. And that felt almost ritualistic by the time I was done. Um, yeah, I don't know, I think I'll go, I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I am, um, I was like thinking about this and um, I have realized that uh, there are only a few things that actually allow me to relax, which just says that I'm actually a, a fairly anxious person. But, um, and like you, I, I'm, I'm a, I am a people pleaser and constantly running around. Um, and I've discovered that actually physical activity is one of the few things that causes my brain to kind of slip into a different mode and it allows me to um relax because I can't like I can't be on my phone I can't be reading I'm not talking I'm just like focused on other things so it's very meditative um and I didn't realize that I needed that until I went to Costa Rica and was like why am I doing this like why like why am I so like because I would get up and go for a little trot for half an hour in the mornings and then I would do my surf lesson so then by the afternoon, also because I was alone, which was amazing, um, I was relaxed enough to just be able to write and not be completely distracted by my job, like lesson planning and teaching and whatnot. Um, and I, I have kept that up because I'm, I'm training for the marathon right now. So I'm running like a crazy person, um, which is actually not good every day, but but. <laughs> That's like another conversation. Like it's good that I'm being active, but. I guess I took jazz music back with me. Um, I used to listen to jazz all the time and I just stopped. Um, and being at the Roxy and listening to it every day just really kind of rekindled my love for it. And um, I don't know, I think, it's been, I think it's been affecting my writing because you're listening to the, to the rhythm and variations and um, it just makes me it makes me think more musically about about the the work that I'm doing. So that's what I took with me was was a new found a, a, a rekindled love for jazz music. I think I'm in sort of in line with Jessica in a way. Um, there was a moment in which I did really have to like pause in Hawaii in in terms of like I think I'm just a very ambitious uh, person in terms of like. Uh, uh, playwriting or career rise or whatever that may mean and so like I'll have these very very specific goals that I like feel like I need to get done but then again it's also just arbitrary <laughs> in the grand scheme of things and I think there's like just this moment of being like literally everyone had told me like blue like you can like just take some time to yourself <laughs> and it didn't sink in until like a few days and I remember like we went like I of course I had planned like everything that was going to happen 
in during this week literally like everything even like breaks and like there was just one day where it was like wow I'm like tired and like we ended up at a, a beach that wasn't necessarily like planned because Hawaii is like packed with everyone who was trying to escape COVID so I think it was like packed me up at this beach and we just stayed there and like saw the sunset and I was just like we're just like being still and like being present and so like I feel like that was a thing that I took away and like moments since then like I'll be like oh wait like it's okay <laughs> it's okay to like actually like be still like you should be present and like then then that allows me to like do the thing that I would want to do if I were not sitting here thinking about these goals or things I should be doing there's nothing that we sh like should be doing more than like things that fulfill us or like make us feel some type of joy especially during this time so like I've had moments of that since I've been back where I was like oh I finished this puzzle <laughs> I finished this painting I started but I left alone because I thought I needed to do other things that were more important mm -hmm. um so I think that's something that at least like resonated for me Something I'm hearing in the four different retreats you all are describing is a belief that I've grown to hold very dear, which is when you're offering a playwright a retreat of any sort to try to keep the shoulds off of it. Um, a productive retreat can actually be a really counterintuitive idea if the playwright themselves isn't the one driving for it. So suggesting that there would be pages due or um, a certain, you know, like quantity of proving you did the retreat in a certain way is counterintuitive to what I think I've learned that playwrights need, which is to listen to their own internal writing metronome. So Jessica has a new draft that she did have a deadline for and really wanted to get through and so got to use the time there. Lou, you've mentioned that you had just finished a play, wanted to be soaking up intel for a new play and so the pace was different and the the look might have been different but the impact on writing and what even being a writer even entails which is so much imagination and and taking the things you all filter about the real world and using your distinct points of view to offer them up to us audience members um i think this this little chat has inadvertently become the like primer on the various ways that a retreat for a writer is a very personal, very individual, and always beneficial um, thing. I mean, there's something to be said for just having new stimuli um, in a way, like after this year. Um, I mean, I know that I, I, I did settle early on that I wanted to leave the country um, because I, my plays, no matter what they're about, often are also about kind of American identity and like what it means to be an American. So I was very interested in kind of doing something like blue, I guess, like very opposite to New York, like something that was just paced very differently and where I could have, where I could actually encounter new faces um, since I'm mostly in my apartment, which is very, very small um, with my partner um, and in Brooklyn and like a, the, the same few blocks. Uh, so that was really, great to have that stimuli um, and have to have like just a different pace. Like that was very stimulating to me. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm really glad we got to do this program because I, I think there's like a real world where it doesn't have to just be the replacement for the other type of work we do. It, it doesn't have to stay tied to COVID. It really it was beautiful because, you know, rather than Kari and I deciding what you would or wouldn't be comfortable with with COVID, it was just you. Like, like you said, I don't think it replaces the Yale residency at all. I think that's in itself very different and also has all its great uh, benefits. Um, but this, and this, yeah, it's just totally different, but all, all great and all needed, all necessary. Even without COVID, leave the space that they're in because like, you know, it's hard. It's like, we don't have like a surplus of funds or money just laying around to like actually go fill our well at, as we would want to. So yeah, even without it, it's, it's needed. Yeah, do it all the time. It's amazing. Yeah. It's like best retreat I've ever gone on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.
it was so great. It really was. Um, I just was like dumbfounded when you approached me and said, do you want to just go on a trip like by yourself? Yes. All the time. I remember receiving that email and just like, could, I couldn't contain myself. It was, <laughs> it was exactly what I needed at the time when I needed it. So yes, please keep doing it. And thank you to the foundation, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> but thank you all so much for your time. We really appreciate you gathering with us to rehash your adventures. It was so good to see all of you. Bye. Bye.